everybody, and thank you for joining us. Today's session is What's Next for the States in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I'm Steve Rauschenberger, a, a NCSL past president, one of those uh, guys that keeps reappearing. Uh, I'm in chairman of the um, NCSL Dead President Society as well, but it's an unpaid position. I'm happy to be here. Um, we're going to have just a few announcements, uh, uh, some housekeeping. Um, keep in mind this session is being live streamed, so what you say could go a lot of places. Uh, be cautious and uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Dick Cocky from the NCSL Health Program staff to give us some information. Thank you, Senator Rosenberg, and more importantly, thank you all for joining us this morning uh, for what we hope will be an interesting session. Uh, as we just heard, a uh, couple of housekeeping and resource questions. Uh, first of all, you heard that this is live streamed and just so that you know you may be on camera, although the cameras will be primarily pointed up here. Uh, the, all of the handouts that we have for the session, uh, hopefully you have those packets. For those of you who are out of the, who are not here in the room or not here in Seattle, uh, that material is all posted online, and this is the somewhat uh, lengthy URL for that, uh, but if you go to the NCSL main page, there should be a link for resources, and it can get you those materials. Uh, finally, we are going to do a poll. There will be time for question and answers, but to keep the session lively, we're going to do, a, an atten for those who are in attendance, a chance to weigh in with your opinion. We'll be passing out low-tech, good old 3 by 5 cards, where you can give your estimate on two questions, which we'll post on the screen, and your estimates will be anonymous. For the Q&A, we will uh, hope to get answers during the discussion, but then we will open the mic for the question and answer section toward the end. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to Senator Rauschenberg. We planned a lively de debate and discussion this morning. We've got lots of viewpoints. Um, today in the United States, we're kind of living through the convergence of uh, <laughs> private sector health care, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and uh, the new aspects of the Affordable Care Act. Um, we've all witnessed, uh, you know, five years and, and a few months of um, deliberations at the federal level where they tried to decide with what they passed was actually the law. We've had two Supreme Court reviews where a fee was a tax, but not a tax until it was a fee. Uh, we've had the discussion of whether state means state or state means any part of the government. Um, those things seem to be now settled law by the Supreme Court. So now, you know, we kind of look forward to where we head in health care in the United States today. Um, you know, we've got far more government involvement than ever before. Uh, the opportunity to kind of reshape uh, health care into something that's a, a good for our children and good for the next generation. This morning, we're going to hear from several of the nation's hands-on experts uh, that have them look back a little bit about where we've come from in the last five years and what may be next. Joel uh, Ario comes to us from uh, Pennsylvania and Oregon, where he was the state insurance commissioner and then became the founding director of one of the newly created federal offices to oversee the creation of health exchanges in the 50 states. Now uh, known as CCIIO, which is, uh, is there a, a pronunciation for that acronym? CCIO. CCIO, okay. Uh, part of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at HHS, probably buried on page 19 of their webpage somewhere. Um, now safely off the government payroll, uh, he remains an expert observer uh, and advisor on the moving parts so far. Joining him for the first part of the kind of uh, discussion of the issues, we also have Joe Antos, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining AEI, uh, Joe was the Director of Health and Human Resources for the Congressional Budget Office. Um, he also has held senior positions in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Office of Management and Budget, OMB in the Beltway Jargon, and he spent seven years working with Maryland. Um, 
what we're going to do is there's three main topics that the speakers kind of wanted to do a little bit of point, counterpoint and discussion on. Uh, the three main are going to be kind of a, a first a discussion between the two of them uh, uh, on health exchanges themselves. Next on Medicaid, Medicaid expansion and the future of Medicaid. Uh, and then uh, subject three for their kind of discussion is going to be um, the future of waivers and, and other issues in, in health care. Uh, I'm first going to start with Joel. Yep. Okay, Joel's going to go first. Joel is the provider of the slides, but uh, we've been assured by both Joe and Joel that they're accurate. Uh, thank you, Steve. And so we have up first a map of the states to do a little bit of level setting on the current status of state marketplaces versus uh, federal marketplaces. You notice we deliberately did not use red and blue. We're trying to be past the uh, deep partisanship that this issue seems to stir up every time it's uh, discussed. And the second reason is these are the colors of the best college football team in America. So um, <laughs> you can draw your own. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the, as you see from this map, there are 17 state-based marketplaces today, 16 states plus D.C. They're in the green. And there are 34 federal market, federal, uh, federally facilitated marketplaces uh, in, the, in the country. The first takeaway here is because the King decision went for the government, the 34 states do not have the bind of not being able to continue to access subsidies, so there is no immediate impetus for any of those states to change, um, and I don't expect any of them to change this year, um, maybe not even next year, maybe not until the next election at least, but part of my point here is going to be there could be change in the longer term for those states, and by the same token, the 17 states that are uh, state-based exchanges now are likely to stay state-based exchanges. Four of them have changed in one respect. They've given up on their own technologies. We probably, if we were rewriting the law again, would think to do more of the technology centralized. From the beginning, certain parts of it were centralized. We probably should have centralized more of it. But now that healthcare.gov is relatively stable, still plenty of room for improvement, <laughs> Four states have said that's a better technology platform to rely on. So New Mexico, Nevada, Oregon, and Hawaii are all relying on that platform. But one of my key takeaways today is that that doesn't mean that they're giving up their state-based exchanges. All of them have strong reasons why they want to continue to be state-based exchanges. It has to do with the authority between the state and federal government in ways that many of you out there will understand. It is possible that more of the 17 states will move to that new model where they rely on the federal IT platform but keep their state-based exchange. And the federal government has said they're going to issue some more guidance, probably in the form of rules this uh, fall, about exactly what it takes to be one of those what they call supported state-based uh, marketplaces. So bottom line, I expect the lines to stay about where they are. Um, before I turn it over to Joe, I'll give two points of view here um, on, on that overall map. The first one is just to reveal my fundamental perspective on this from 10 years as an insurance commissioner in Oregon and Pennsylvania, one year, only one year, um, with the federal government, that initial year setting up the regulatory framework for the exchanges, a very state-based framework at that point, because I came out of the states, that's why I was hired for that job. And so the, the point of view that I bring to this is nothing I saw in my one year with the federal government changed my view one iota about the fact that when it comes to implementing a law or regulation, the states are infinitely preferable to the federal government for doing that implementation. So I think a lot still rides on whether we have more states and more control over the implementation of the, of the Affordable Care Act or whether states continue as they do today to defer that responsibility to the federal government. So that's my point of view. Second point of view is that under the current construct, very hard to see how states move. So I think the federal government has to find a way to open up more flexibility around the decisions around exchanges, around the decisions around Medicaid expansion as well. One model for it is what are called the alternative Medicaid expansions, which a lot of my governor in Pennsylvania said, I'm not expanding Medicaid, I'm privatizing Medicaid. Um, we need to find ways to allow states to do it their own way, and we need to find that on the exchanges too. That may connect us in the 1332. 
Um, and so those are my two fundamental points. States are better, um, and in order to get the states involved here, I think the federal government has to loosen up some of its regulatory stranglehold, which is the very reason why I think the federal government's not good at doing these things. Um, so that's the, that's the starting point. And the last thing I'll say, because a lot of people say, well, it doesn't really matter anymore whether it's federal or state because the subsidies flow. Um, if you're a federal state, just take insurance regulations, which is the area I know best. You, every decision you make under this law is, in the, in the context of the marketplaces, advisory to the federal government. The federal government has the final say. If you're a state-based exchange, it's like the HIPAA law. There's still a federal standard you're enforcing, but the state determines, interprets the statute, has the final say on what the law means, and the federal government can take them to court if they want, but ultimately the state's in the driver's place. And if you don't think that difference between advisory and state final decision matters, you ought to talk to your insurance regulators about the different ways that fundamentally affects who's in charge of uh, the insurance marketplaces. Okay, so uh, I have a, a couple of messages uh, that I think are uh, 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 realistic. Uh, every state should hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Uh, uh, the best won't happen and neither will the worst, but if you're prepared for problems, then when problems you didn't expect arise, uh, you're more likely to uh, not crumble under the pressure. Uh, the reality is that uh, health spending has slowed down, health spending growth has, has slowed down in the last few years, but uh, that's a temporary phenomenon. We've got a little honeymoon right now. And so I think the way to really look at all of this is, uh, from a state budget perspective, what's it going to cost us? And what is the, what is the outlook, uh, down the road? And the outlook is really not much different than, than where it was before. We're, we're, we're going to go back to probably six, seven percent, uh, increases in, in, in costs, uh, overall. So that's going to be an issue for state, for state budgets. Uh, the, the other, the other point is that, um, um, you know, in a sense, uh, if you're hoping for something to happen in the next year and a half, um, forget it. Not going to happen. Uh, but there will be new opportunities, no matter who is elected president. Uh, and I think that's what states should be looking at. <clears throat> what are the opportunities that are going to arise? There's no question that uh, when you have a president whose last name is not Obama, <clears throat> that that will be a person, no matter who it is, who will be able to and will want to make changes in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, many of those changes are, are crying out for uh, you know, for implementation, uh, other things, uh, may, may, you know, may be uh, more controversial, but there's, there's no question that that's an issue. As far as, uh, states <clears throat> staying with state exchanges, I think that's a real question. <clears throat> uh, the fact is that when people talk about whether exchanges are success successful, they're generally thinking about it in terms of enrollment. And I think that most of the exchanges have, have, finally gotten over the hub of being able to enroll people. <clears throat> but that doesn't mean that the rest of the exchange function is operating very well at all. That's still a problem. It's still a problem getting the information, connecting the dots between the uh, beneficiary, between the state government or the federal government uh, and the insurance company. Uh, it's a real problem still uh, if your uh, personal circumstances change. So you can enroll. <clears throat> but uh, if something changes that's material to either the subsidy that you might be getting or something else, you want to change plans, uh, that, that turns still is a, is a big, big problem. Um, so, so when you think about whether states should be move, uh, you know, moving towards state exchanges or whether those states that have state exchanges are going to continue them, uh, there's a very serious, not just technical risk, but there's a political risk. Uh, 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 and that's separate from the question of uh, whether a state is allowed to regulate its market. I think those are two separate issues. I think we need to keep them separate, and I think in the next administration they will be made more separate. Uh, did that pretty well cover can, I, can I just yeah. clarify one thing? I think that by that last statement we agree. The issue is not who runs the IT. That should be done by whoever is best at doing it. The issue is who regulates the marketplace, and under the law, until it changes, if you're a federalist state, the regulation of those marketplaces 
the state is advisory to the federal government and a state exchange runs its own marketplace. So that is the distinction in the law. It would be like saying under Medicaid, it doesn't really matter whether the Medicaid decisions at the state level are advisory or whether they're actually controlled at the state level. It matters a lot. Uh, well, right. Uh, that, of course, is one of the defects of the ACA. It was trying to federalize uh, uh, insurance regulation as much as possible. Which in a sense, uh, this was uh, supposed to be an incentive to get the states to uh, uh, establish state exchanges. Uh, the threat was, there were lots of threats, but this specific threat was, we'll take all your control away. Now, uh, you know, the, uh, sometime in the last week, the, the White House uh, or the administration uh, issued a statement to the states, encouraging them to do a better job of negotiating with insurance companies to keep insurance affordable. But what's that really about? Uh, that's about getting a low number this year. I think the real question is, what is sustainable over time? That's, that's what should matter to the states. That's what you're going to be, if you're holding the bag, it's going to be that bag you're holding, and you're going to be holding it for a long time. I think it's a real issue what is actually sustainable in terms of premiums, in terms of benefits, uh, and in terms of responsibilities. Before you guys go a little further, I want to throw in a couple of questions. I mean, before the ACA, uh, the, the, health the health provisioning, uh, health insurance provisioning in the United States was kind of, it was either Medicare, it was Medicaid, uh, both one qualifying base, both basically on age and the other on economic circumstances. And the balance was um, mostly either employer-assisted or agency-based uh, health care. So, you know, you, you had someone, an intermediary, if you were in the non-Medicare Medicaid, that helped you select your plan, figure out your plan, understand your deductible, understand your responsibilities under the... Some of the promise, when early, when I was a long, long time ago, when you used to walk to the legislature, um, you know, the idea of marketplaces was to open up and get out from under the market control that a few carriers had in the, the marketplace. The idea that Illinois could, uh, an Illinoisan could buy an Indiana-based health care plan without being interfered with was what, mar what the, these exchanges were originally. In, in the, the, the latest iteration, we, it, it's a little different. And I think the missing piece is what, what would you two say the, the experience of our constituents is with the health care exchanges? You know, I don't, not what the federal government likes about or the state government likes about or the insurance commissioners. What, what's happening to our constituents who are logging on? Are they getting effective information? Are, it, it, are, are we meeting the obligation to help them select the right plan? Are they learning how to utilize health care? I mean, that's what I think the missing piece that I want maybe you to briefly comment on. Right. So, uh, you know, health insurance, we all know health insurance is a complicated topic. There's no doubt about it. The, even the word deductible turns out not to be very clear. Uh, we used to think we knew what that meant, but it, uh, now the word deductible means a lot of different things depending on the plan. Uh, so we're obviously in a transition period. Uh, I wouldn't be critical of the exchange process in not instantly giving everybody uh, the kind of information that they will completely understand. This is a learning process. Uh, uh, obviously, we can always say, uh, you know, we can improve, this, but that's always the case. Um, I think it really is a question of people, uh, over time, I would say it's going to be a matter of a few years, uh, uh, coming to grips with the fact that they will have decisions to make. Also, the market has to uh, sort itself out. Uh, there are an awful lot of Supposed options that are not very, they're not very different from each other, uh, and um, uh, you know it's it's well known that if you have too many things that look like choices, that people have a tendency to freeze up. Uh, I'm not arguing for single payer. I'm not arguing for uh, you know the government saying pick three, uh, but I am arguing for giving the market a chance to sort. sort I'm sure out. glad you're not a car executive. Too many choices, they all freeze up. Not knowing whether to buy a Ford, a Hyundai, or a General Motors car. Quick question: what, 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 What's our constituents? What are they experiencing today? Well, so one piece of context, because you raised it, is very important. There are 160 million Americans that are in employer-based uh, coverage. Um, their marketplace hasn't changed very much, although it's increasingly moving to look like an exchange through private exchanges and through the websites that insurance companies themselves run. They're, the market cap on the marketplaces, the, uh, the uh, ACA-based marketplace, is probably about 30 million. 
So it's a relatively small sliver of the overall market. But both of those markets are moving to a vastly different consumer experience, a web-based experience where you're, you have tools, increasingly for people like my sons, on their mobile devices to help them navigate. So I actually disagree a little bit with you. I'll take the more uh, market-oriented side of that argument about choice. Stuart Butler and I put out a piece saying that, you know, if you have a good search tool, you want there to be more, as many choices out there for you as possible. You just want to be able to use an app to sort through them. About 99.5% of people basically don't want to face even two or three choices. They're looking at things against each other on a spreadsheet. They want an app that will say, here's my basic facts. Here's what I use for health care. I want to be able to do it inside of three minutes. And then I want you to bring me a recommendation on my phone as to what I should buy and why. And if I don't like it, it's an iterative process. It works like a Google search. If you want to look at where the state of the art is on this, look at the websites that web brokers use today. Look at something. Um, uh, uh, well, let's look at a number of different ones. I probably shouldn't cite a particular one. But the future of web, of, of the way people buy insurance, I'm totally convinced whether it's through an employer or through these exchanges, will be through applications that allow you very quickly to zero in on what you want, just like people no longer go to the library to search things. They just type in a few keystrokes on, on Google. So I think that's where the system goes. Again, repeat my point. If the, fe the states are in charge of the, by, by the federal government, they're going to get there slower than the states that have control over the way these marketplaces work at the state level. Joe, quick comment. Okay, hey, I, I, you're talking about a future. I agree with that future. But we're really talking about what's going to be available in the next few years. And the answer is that uh, the, there's, there was not a sufficient transition from the old style uh, individual market. The old style actually had human beings talking to each other. And that's still a very valuable uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, and, and basically, the ACA wanted to cut out all those nasty insurance agents. That was, that was a very bad decision technically. It's very bad politically. Uh, they've come back a little bit. But the reality is that until we get to uh, uh, this nirvana, which I think applies more to my kids than to me, um, I still have trouble with my cell phone, uh, uh, you know, we're going to go through a long period where we're going to need hands-on help. Yeah, if ACA wasn't a monopoly, I wonder, you know, it, Stephen Jobs and Apple would not have rolled out the iPhone and said, we'll try to get it working in the next couple of years after you buy it. Uh, so it, I, I think in all of this, we just need to keep our constituents' experience in mind. I mean, it has not been as good an experience as I think we all would have hoped for. We're going to turn to Medicaid. When I was in the state legislature, I had the privilege of chairing the Appropriation Committee. I was astounded when Medicaid reached 17% of the state budget in Illinois. Today, I think it's about two and a half times that. Uh, the future of Medicaid is intimately tied to, um, obviously, the Affordable Care Act. A good portion of our gains in, uh, in new insured uh, Americans is through the expansion of Medicaid. So we're going to ask our two experts. We're going to start first with Joe and then go to Joe to talk a little bit about Medicaid, the future, and whether we can trust our federal cousin who's now picking up most of the bill uh, that we, you know, what's going to happen when the music stops. Joe? Uh, well, of course, the music is already winding down. The, the ACA <clears throat> says that uh, the uh, federal subsidy for uh, uh, new, uh, you know, enrollees under the new rules uh, for Medicaid, um, uh, that that subsidy will drop down to uh, 90 percent eventually in a few years. Um, that's something that I think uh, people recognize. I think the, the bigger concern would be um, – uh, if the federal government uh, runs into uh, financial difficulties, as we periodically do, uh, what happens next? Uh, uh, certainly there will be no additional money. I think the question is how much will be taken away. I think that's a risk. Now, that, that said, uh, you know, it is true that states that expanded, <coughs> um, by and large, uh, probably did better in terms of the balance between money being paid out by their citizens through taxes to the federal government only to be recycled back to their states. That's not universally true, obviously. Uh, there are some states, uh, pretty well-off states, that, that where incomes were high and their income taxes are high. They probably didn't. They don't think about that, undoubtedly. Uh, I'm thinking New York, maybe. Um, but for most states, it, it probably it was kind of a, a terms of trade issue. You could argue that, yeah, you, you make out well. 
the, the issue, I think, is not so much the money. I think it's the responsibility. I, once, you've, once you've expanded, then there's always the question, uh, what leeway will you have to modify your Medicaid program? Uh, again, I'm thinking not this administration, but the next administration. And, and uh, the, the more people you bring in, the harder it is to make changes. It's, it's human nature. Uh, once you've got a lot of people in a program, it's, it's, they, they are used to the way it's supposed to work, and when it changes, it's a problem. So that's an issue. The, the, the other aspect of this is that every state experienced the, the so-called woodwork effect. So every state had an increase in the number of people uh, in Medicaid uh, where the match rate was the same as it has always been. <coughs> so in fact, uh, overall, if you look at, at both parts of Medicaid, the expansion part of it where there was additional money and the uh, non-expansion part that still had expansion, uh, the net result, I think, in most states was uh, a, a ding, at least, and, and, and in some cases, a pretty heavy hit on the state budget. So a couple points on the, on the Medicaid expansion. I think the 30 states that have done it have been quite satisfied uh, with the results. Um, it's hard to find stakeholders on either the buyer side, people who purchase the product or are involved in representing the consumer side of the equation, or even more so, the supplier side. They do benefit uh, from, from the Medicaid expansion, but they're pretty much all the economic constituencies and the consumer constituencies line up in favor of the expansion. It's very hard to find any constituency out there um, that's involved in the, in the healthcare marketplace that doesn't take that point of view. The one state that where there was talk about maybe backtracking was Kentucky, where relatively conservative gubernatorial candidates said it was going to uh, reverse the Medicaid expansion. He's in the last week said, oh, maybe not now that I've been a little more educated uh, on the issue. So I think, you know, there's no turning back. But I also think that the 30 states that have not expanded, I mean, the 20 states that have not expanded Medicaid are not going to expand it, most likely, unless they get more flexibility um, from the federal government. And again, I'll go back to my point that the federal government is not very good about implementing laws. They're good about setting broad standards. And so they've been, I think, relatively inflexible about alternative Medicaid expansion ideas. And I think that area needs to open up. Um, and there are many good ideas. Uh, just to throw out one, the, the states that have not expanded Medicaid, um, the population from 100 to 138 percent of poverty has been big purchasers in the exchanges. Um, that's worked out relatively well. They get pretty good cost sharing reductions and so forth. Um, and so to ask those states if they're going to expand Medicaid to go back and switch those people who are now doing well in exchange products into uh, a Medicaid product, I think states ought to have some flexibility on that. Now, that's heresy on, on my side of the table, but I'm trying to yeah. mix it up a little bit and make points on both sides here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, just a quick, uh, abs absolutely, we're, I think we're in complete agreement on the you other, know, why 138% of poverty? Well, the answer is, had nothing to do with, with reality, it had to do with the budget score. That's part of reality. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, it isn't. I worked at CBO. I can assure you those scores are not real. I have produced many fictional scores in my life. <laughs> First of all, I want to tell people that are standing that we have some chairs over on this wall. You're welcome if you work your way across. We, we enjoy it. We've got a really lively session going here. I guess I was astounded when you guys said that all of the interests in Washington and most of the state capitals are, are excited about or happy with Medicaid. So the hospitals that are getting paid, the doctors that are getting paid, the uh, advocacy associations who want to put people into some kind of medical care are happy. Uh, what, how is this working out for consumers? I guess when I was in the legislature, I, we used to ask groups, you know, how many, who's got health insurance, who's, you know, who's Medicare, who's, who's got private care, who's got Blue Cross, Blue Shield. And I used to ask the audience, would any of you trade your coverage for Medicaid? Uh, and, and I don't remember very many hands raised. Uh, in fact, in a lot of states, Medicaid represents access challenges. So did we really delay health care reform by expanding Medicaid, by, <laughs> by moving people in a flash cut into a program we know is not optimal? I mean, are we just delivering for the politicians for the next election, or are we really going to be able to move um, health care uh, along the line instead of just health care reimbursement? Well, you're, you're living up to your reputation for a provocative question, Steve, but I think one of the functions of the ACA bringing these two markets together and saying everybody to this lab point 
is Medicaid eligible, everybody above it is exchange eligible, is two things. One, to make sure everybody's got an option so we get to broad coverage. But two, is to force those markets to be converged, to become more like each other. So we know for a certainty that if Medicaid continues to be a completely different program over here from the exchanges, that's a grossly inefficient system. You now have the big <laughs> providers, the same day that Rick Perry said that this is the Titanic going down, I'm not subscribing to Medicaid expansion, Anthem put a $6 billion bet on the Medicaid market by buying Amerigroup. That is the future. The insurers and others are going to be across these lines. These markets converge, and Medicaid today is, lo and behold, private insurers, just like they are in Medicare Advantage, just like they are in the exchanges, private insurers have more and more involvement in running the program, in, in administering the benefit <coughs> under uh, government guidelines. So this is going to lift Medicaid up in the ways that you're talking about. Okay, not going to happen overnight, but that's the goal. God, I hope so, Joe. Quick thought on, uh, uh, on quality. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, convergence could mean lifting up, could mean lowering down. It's a little hard to know. Uh, I mean, uh, you're, uh, Joel is absolutely right. Uh, states are basically using managed care organizations and Medicaid. Uh, uh, you know, this is actually not where the money is in Medicaid, as everybody knows. It's long-term care and, and the elderly for Medicaid. So we're really talking about the easy part of, of the Medicaid market. <coughs> uh, 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 but the reality is that states are not looking to raise payment rates to those managed care organizations. Uh, they're under pressure. They're going to have increasing pressure. Uh, and, so, and so I don't see this as being necessarily the solution to uh, the access problem. Now, with regard to access, uh, we know there's been a lot of complaints, whether they're ju fully justified or not. There's been a lot of complaints uh, for the bronze and silver plans about the narrow networks. Uh, I, I say everybody ought to grow up on that one. Uh, <clears throat> narrow networks is where we're going to be, and not just for low-income people, for everybody. Uh, smart narrow networks do not, does not necessarily mean poor quality care or actually poor access. It may just mean uh, a somewhat greater efficiency and a little bit better direction uh, uh, for uh, you know, the more serious patients. <coughs> you you just one minute. If you're at a table with empty chairs, would you raise your hand? We've got a lot of people looking for chairs. Everybody take just a minute. We'll let these guys swallow and, and uh, take a breath. Um, can I make a quick point? Yeah, yeah, no, please. I, I, so if you, if you look, I just want to echo a, a point Joe just made. If you look at the Alliance for Community Health Plans, they are the alliance of the Kaisers of the world, Group Health, Intermountain, Health Partners in Minnesota, Independence in New York. They're integrated provider delivery systems. They have the narrowest of networks compared to most of what's available in the marketplace. Guess what? Every year, they dominate the quality ratings for Medicare Advantage because if you actually want to manage quality in a health plan, you actually need to have a manageable network that you can work with. You can't manage quality in a PPO. So there's a total connection between both price points and better quality for a well-run network. doesn't mean there aren't some shabby networks out there. doesn't mean some insurers aren't doing their networks only on price and not paying attention to quality. But it does mean that narrow or value-based networks are the future. We're going to go to one quick lightning uh, round question. You've got to answer quick because we're going to lose uh, Senator Mike Gronstall on the end. So we want to give him a couple of minutes to address a couple of issues he wanted to raise. But I mean, Medicaid started out as a state federal partnership. The idea was as long as the states had skin in the game, they would help control costs, make sure enrollment worked, actually check people's applications, make sure they didn't have hidden assets, all those kind of things. They would also put some pressure on the provider network to control the cost. Well, that kind of sort of went away a little bit in a lot of ways, but really started with the old uh, kid care <laughs> program out of Washington, D.C., and then kind of accelerated. And now uh, the federal government's kind of marching in and saying, we'll pay 100% of your expansion. The Federal Reserve's kicked open the door. We'll buy federal bonds forever. Congress is spending 40% more than the revenue they're taking in. But at some point, some people think, maybe I'm one of them, maybe I'm not, you can guess, uh, but when the music stops, when the music stops and the feds can no longer write a check based on Chinese buying um, U.S. debt, uh, it's not much of a partnership anymore. Why doesn't the federal government simply federalize Medicaid? Because, I, again, I want the states to be more in charge of on the ground administering federal programs and to give that to the federal 
government. I eventually want all these programs to look like the ACA exchanges and like Medicare Advantage and like Part D of Medicaid and like some of the MCO programs where private carriers compete under government standards to deliver the very best product to consumers and consumers have a bunch of choices uh, in the marketplace. I think that is the <coughs> best system. We'll still fight as a country over what level of government should subsidize different populations and whether the regulation should be really heavy duty or lighter than light and laissez-faire oriented, but if we had that basic structure of private insurers delivering the product, I, I think that's the, that, that is the right solution for America. It, it may be, but you don't think that the federal subsidies are, are exactly the wrong uh, medicine to uh, expand the, the a rational private sector in involvement? I don't think you we, – we need to bring the cost of health care down. That's a discussion about payment reform and value-based payments. But I don't think you can today make our health care system work without fairly large-scale subsidies. The states cannot afford to provide that, so the federal government's going to provide that. And I'd, I'd be interested in Joe's opinion, but I increasingly hear the Republicans saying not only are we not going to be able to offer a full-scale replacement for the ACA, we're going to be able to – go after the parts that we want to improve on, we're also not going to be able to roll back in a major way the notion that there are federal subsidies here. We're going to instead have to talk about how they ought to be redirected more efficiently. Joe, sorry for the bad question. Quick comment, and then we're going to go to the senator. Right. So uh, I think the uh, question – I agree with Joel largely. Uh, uh, the closer you get, it, closer you get the, the governance and the control to the consumer – the more likely it is that it will be responsive to the consumer. Uh, an, an odd concept, I think, largely in healthcare, but we could try it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, as far as the as far as the subsidies go, I mean, uh, leaving aside whether anybody can afford whatever, uh, you know, it's the political reality that once you've given subsidies, they don't go away. So I think it really is a question of how those subsidies operate, how much flexibility states are allowed to have. I find it remarkable that we always call Medicaid a federal-state partnership when it's really federally controlled state implementation. Well, we'll get back to you two agreeing on rationing right after we hear from uh, the <laughs> senator from <laughs> Iowa. Um, Mike, I know, I know you've got to catch a flight, and we were hoping to have you on the response. Actually, not a flight. I have to go introduce somebody else uh, at another time. But let me, uh, you know, I'm not even sure where to start after <laughs> after these two guys are done fighting. Um, three guys. Um, no, they were three guys. guys. Three guys. Three guys. <laughs> uh, so, so what I, I was the quintessential purple state. We have a Democratic Senate, a Republican House, and a Republican governor. And we came up with a grand compromise. Um, we did not, in spite of the map, we did not expand Medicaid in Iowa. We created the Iowa Wellness Plan and the Iowa Marketplace Choice Plan, which was an expansion of Medicaid to 138% of poverty. So um, we played with what we called it, and we played with the process for it. And there were some good elements uh, that the Republican governor, in particular, insisted on, and that was uh, that we that we make everybody on that get um, get a wellness exam. Everybody that's going to be assigned get a wellness exam and a complete health risk assessment. Um, so we said to the governor, we're certainly willing to look at those things that will help this population become more healthy. Um, and in exchange, um, you're going to agree to cover 100, uh, 150, potentially 150,000 islands. But let's go, let's go up, you know, let's go up 30,000, 50,000 feet and look down on what, you know, what has society been, you know, the, the marketplace wasn't working very well all by itself before. Insurance is designed to spread risk. Groups are designed to avoid risk. And the more we had groups set up or HMOs that grab the young people, and, and there's all of this cost shifting that goes on. If somebody in this room falls down clutching their chest right now, society has pretty much agreed, pretty solid majority of people in this country agree, regardless of what kind of insurance or government program they have, we should take them to a hospital and take care of them. This go I, I remember when I was uh, when I was six or seven years old. I was turned a corner in Council Bluffs. I learned to ride a bike. I ran into a parked car. Well, don't laugh at the poor six-year-old. She <laughs> laughed. I ran into a parked car. My brother helped me home. My father took me to the doctor at the hospital in the emergency room. Probably not 
the wisest care, but it probably was okay in 1956 or 57. Uh, so takes me there, puts me up on the table, white cloth kind of like this, and moves my knee this way, says, does that hurt? Yeah. Does this hurt? Yeah, everything hurt. And I will never forget that doctor's words to my father. He said, I don't think anything's broken. Now, you can laugh at that because that wasn't particularly reassuring to the six or seven year old. I don't <laughs> think anything's broken. My father was a banker in Council Us. He said, uh, The doctor said, Do you have health insurance, Paul? My dad said, Yeah, we've got good insurance at the bank. I remember feeling special that day because I was a banker's son. Well, I think our society has really come to the point where we don't think anybody ought to worry about whose son or daughter they, ha they, they are to get access to health care coverage. I think we decided that when somebody's elderly and they use all of their assets in nursing homes and they're out of assets now, that we don't throw them on the street. So the heart attack, the elderly person that needs a nursing home and has no way to pay for it, and kids, all deserve access to health care coverage. And so that, and I think our society has accepted that basic premise. And so now all we're doing is arguing about how to rationally pay for it. And the, the marketplace itself isn't particularly rational. Um, uh, uh, my insurer, and I won't mention colors, but my insurer <laughs> can't, my insurer, uh, by the way, Green and Gold is St. Albert's, uh, the great Catholic high school that I went to, um, they're, they're our school colors, but, but our insurance can't coordinate my colored policy with my wife's policy. We, and, and so the marketplace isn't as rational as some would suggest it is, okay? So, so Iowa did this. We created a separate mechanism for those under 100% of poverty, which was essentially Medicaid expansion, and then this one where you buy it out of the Marketplace Choice Act um, and, and out of the exchange and, and for the population between 100 and 138. And lo and behold, after a year, we're going to sub uh, we have two companies, one co opportunity that went out of business because way too many sick people joined and and drove huge deficits for them. So they're out of business now. And the existing plan Coventry that was still covering uh, said they no longer longer want to offer coverage to this population. So in the waiver application that we're changing this year, the Department of Human Services appointed by the, gov the Republican governor is merging the two plans back together and it is just, well, it's not Medicaid expansion, it is the Iowa Wellness Plan. So um, that's, that's the issue. But, but these challenges were out there before. They were, uh, they were across the board. Hospitals had huge uncompensated care and the mechanism was we will surcharge everybody's private policies to pay for that. And that's what happened in the marketplace out there. So, so there's a lot of problems with this. I can tell you, my brother, who's one year younger than me, so he's 64, <laughs> um, hated going to the exchange in Texas and getting a policy and a provider and figuring out how to make that work. And today, a year later, he says, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. So I think the marketplace is getting better, more people are getting taken care of, and the bugs are getting worked out. Thank you, Senator. Right on time. I was supposed to finish at 1030. You are on the button as usual. <clears throat> and be careful on your bike. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all agree about that hard thing and about the old people, but we're not so sure about bike accidents for people your age. So, uh, there may not be as much consensus as you think, yeah. Um, <clears throat> the next subject that our two experts are going to kind of... Um, to point, counterpoint on, or at least discuss, because they've been kind of converging. You've noticed I've driven them together. Um, the future of waivers and other points and modification of uh, both Medicaid and, and ACA going forward, it's kind of an open script. I don't know. I think it's Joel's turn to go first. Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, two starting points here. Um, one is that the opportunity for waivers is quite broad in the law. You can eliminate the individual mandate, the employer mandate, you can eliminate essential health benefits, uh, you can eliminate the exchange and replace it with some other kind of distribution 
center, you can change the metal levels. Um, as you see on this slide, the, with the door is open wide to start with. What Joe's going to get into in more detail is, and we didn't have, they told me one slide on this, so I put the door open slide. The, the door starting to close slide would have been the guardrails. Um, there are uh, guardrails built into the law to talk about the comprehensiveness of coverage has to stay, uh, coverage has to stay comprehensive, has to stay affordable, uh, budget neutrality is part of the law. Um, and so there's a number of guardrails that we can get into. And so people take different uh, tests on this. Somebody like Stuart Butler from the conservative side looks at the broad open door and says, you know, we can work through those guardrails if we have the right flexibility. Other people jump right to the guardrails, are always skeptical of the government and say they're going to close all the doors um, with those guardrails. And the point I'd make about that is that, you know, depends on who the administration is. And it doesn't look at this point like this administration is going to take a major regulatory stance on guardrails. So it will largely uh, be up to the next administration how the guardrails uh, will get interpreted. But if they're interpreted in flexible ways, and again, remember, I'm on the side of giving states a lot of flexibility. I learned early on it. I, mean, I sort of invited the one thing that always aligned the most conservative insurance commissioner with the most liberal insurance commissioner in my 15 years at the NEIC, five before I became a commissioner, was that we all thought we would be better to regulate the markets at the state level than to have the federal government dictating all the A, Bs, and Cs of, of, the, of the marketplace. And so I hope that there is wide uh, uh, flexibility under the 1332 waivers, and then I think that can start to be, we're going to hear when we hear from the legislators, it's just a non-starter to build an exchange today and, and Medicaid expansion in many states unless there's more flexibility. One way is just to give it under the current law. Another way is to use the 1332 uh, waivers um, as that process. Now Joe's going to rain on my parade. but Well, actually, I think you did a pretty good job yourself. <laughs> uh, you know, the reality is that the, the uh, 1332 waivers um, uh, won't be granted at the earliest is uh, 2017. Uh, and it'll take more time than that. I, I think there is an opportunity there. Uh, and this is not a bad time to start working on it. Because if you really want to do something useful, don't just make little changes. Uh, <clears throat> think about how to uh, get uh, all of the various uh, state uh, health programs to coordinate and, and operate in a in a sensible way. Uh, we often, when we when we focus on the ACA, there's a tendency to forget about uh, community health centers and and <laughs> other kinds of things and state only uh, type programs. But that's where states are, and that's actually where a lot of healthcare is being delivered. Uh, so so to really uh, make best use of the resources that are available, uh, you, you really need to take a, a wider look at everything and ask, uh, how can we get all these programs to work together in some way? Now, that's not going to be easy because the money interests that are all enthusiastic about expanding Medicaid, they're also not very enthusiastic about changing what they're now doing. They want the checks to flow in, but they don't want to have to change how they do it. Uh, so I think it's going to require not forcing anybody. It's going to require getting people together. This is a big challenge for you, but it's what you have to do. You're the people who can pull them together because they're not going to pull themselves together. They have conflicting interests. So, so I think this is where this is where your job really is incredibly important for the for the next health care reform. So, if we concretize that a little bit more, let's take Arkansas was the first of the alternative Medicaid expansion states, and it basically said. We don't want to build on our current Medicaid program. We want to send this new population into the exchanges instead. And I worked on that case. I sat down there with the insurers and other people, and Arkansas worked out a solution where the newly eligible population could go into the exchanges instead of go into traditional Medicaid, and it's more or less worked the way that was predicted to work in terms of the arguments from Arkansas, which were that there are more carriers participating in that market now on the exchange side because suddenly they have the Medicaid population of 250,000 new people in addition to the original exchange uh, population, and it's dealt with this issue of rates because now the provider rates on the, on the Medicaid side are at the commercial 
pressure pressure point because they're part of the exchange. So part of this is it's, it's definitely an irrational system for Medicaid reimbursement to be different than exchange reimbursement to be different than Medicare reimbursement. So all of these convergence points that Joe's making support bringing those points together, and Arkansas is a, is a test case. Now, they, they still don't feel like they've got enough flexibility. There's some, some, the government put some other things into the deal there that uh, some people didn't like, and so they're still trying to get more flexibility around some of the, some of those points around the deal, and so I don't know for sure how Arkansas will come out. It's still a very contentious issue, but it is one of the places where the 1332 waiver process may be very helpful to bring together both Medicaid expansion and um, the exchanges and other states, I would I think, ought to look at that uh, example. By the way, I, uh, it can't, I think a lot of the 1332 stuff will be small potatoes sort of stuff, just cleaning up some inconsistencies. <laughs> There's three definitions for American Indian in the ACA. Um, states could deal with that. They're, they're just expanding the market to 100, uh, the small business market to 100 doesn't really make any sense from a state regulator's perspective. You could change that small group back to the 50 that all states had before this law. So there's a bunch of things like that to do, too. Maybe some state will attempt the, uh, the Vermont type of single-payer approach. That should be allowed, too. And I, one of the things I always remember in 1332, the, the, uh, the, the, the history of it goes back to bills that were in the Congress way before the ACA. Um, I remember uh, Congressman Price and, and Representative at that time, Tammy Baldwin, coming before my committee at the NEIC, and I said, well, so how do you guys end up agreeing on this? And he said, I think the only thing Tammy and I agree on, Price said, was that we both have enough of the courage of our convictions that we're willing to let states on the other side of the equation get money to experiment and see what they can come up with. And I think if we had that attitude in the country of, you know, we're going to let really robust experiments happen on the conservative side and on the liberal side, you know, we'd get further in, in terms of the best solutions. So, so, Very quick, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, remember that Arkansas, the only reason any of that happened was because uh, they weren't going to have a uh, functioning exchange. In other words, the administration went along with it because – Otherwise, it was going to be an abject failure. Uh, unfortunately, I think that's kind of been the, been the theme uh, in this administration. Uh, and Healthy Indiana is a great example. Healthy Indiana 1.0 was a, was a, a, a very market-oriented, uh, aggressive kind of a plan. You might not like it. It's up to you. You decide. But uh, uh, when Governor Pence came in and wanted to expand it and build on it, he basically got the message, no, we're not going to go along with the ideas that are coming from Indiana. We're going to want something that is <clears throat> much more modest, uh, that is much less flexible. That's, that's ultimately the problem. So, I, you know, we're, we're basically in agreement that we like to see the states be able to do things. Uh, it is notable that Vermont, uh, after a lot of back and forth, finally admitted that uh, single payer is just too damned expensive. <coughs> Look, I, quick lightning rod. I mean, I, I was hoping for a little bit more hope out of you two gentlemen with uh, about 5% of the world population. I think the United States consumes about 30 or 35% of all prescription drugs. The average health care in the United States costs twice what it does in any other developed country. Our health outcomes, our, our, our infant mortality, a lot of things don't seem to track particularly better. I know every hospital executive in America is happy with the expansion of health care. I think we're setting records in constructing new hospital rooms at a time when we probably need need less institutional medicine. So what, what, what on the cost curve practice, um, um, I mean, what, what are the bright people that you guys circulate with talking about that we can do to begin to bend the cost curve and focus the resource on the patient, not on the provider? I mean, do you have one little piece of hope to offer before we go to the legislators? I'm hoping. Okay, well, uh, so I don't know if this is uh, going to uh, feel like hope or uh, despair. Uh, uh, rea reality will set in eventually. And the reality, it, it, my, my version of reality has to do with resources. <coughs> when, you, when you can't spend that much more, when you have a choice of rebuilding the bridge that collapsed uh, or, uh, uh, you know, sending money to, to educate children uh, versus more money for the health sector. Remember, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about money for the health sector. Uh, we're going to have to make a decision. Now, this is the argument for... Uh, decentralizing where the money flows so that we as individuals have a greater appreciation for the cost. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to bear the whole cost. Uh, there are ways to get subsidies into individuals' hands in a way that emphasizes that there are trade-offs. And part of that is 
to establish a good working relationship with a smart physician who also recognizes that there are trade-offs, that it's not just I do a service, I get paid. Is that trade-off, it doesn't mean rationing. Uh, and, and, you, well, well, and you're basically telling us, wait till our, we run out of our grandkids' money. Uh, no, we're going to get there before, before then. <laughs> our, our grandkids are smarter than we are. Uh, and, uh, but, but the reality is that they won't be able to afford us because there are a lot more of us than there are them. So the, the, uh, the coverage that's available in the exchange for individuals is better than what was in the individual market before. That's why people are generally happy with the coverage. But compared to what people get if they work for a large employer, like our senator mentioned, it's not as good coverage. It has higher cost sharing. It has narrower networks. And so I spend most of my time talking to those well-heeled interests that you're talking about who are benefiting from the ACA right now. And invariably, as I go through kind of what the exchanges are doing to coverage in terms of narrower networks, higher cost sharing, they say, please tell me that isn't going to happen in our bread and butter in the large employer marketplace, 160 million people, to which the answer is, oh, it's already happening. Uh, private exchanges and benefit consultants and everybody else is saying this is the right solution for you, too. So I believe we are in an evolution towards, again, the ACA was a bipartisan thing before it became partisan around those kinds of issues, and those kind of pressures combined with the payment reform things are going to bring things together. But the last point, I have to give you a little despair, is I'm always reminded of Yui Reinhardt likes to hold up his little chart, health care spending equals health care income. If you want to cut health care spending, somebody out there has an income attached to that spending, they're going to lose, and you guys all appreciate how Nobody wants to be the one that gets cut. So I'm not saying any of this is easy. People will find all their clever ways to say, oh, it applies to everybody but me. But, <laughs> but we have, well, the pressures are coming. Trust me, the hospitals, other people do feel a pressure they've never felt before around these issues. Well, I, I, Dad was not as hopeful as I hoped for, folks. I, I, I was really hoping to hear that we had a magic bullet and we were going to make institutional medicine give up some of the cash and we could focus on wellness. But maybe it will come from our three legislators. We're joined today by three of the, the bright lights out in the states that are trying to help lead their states. Uh, and, you know, through the thicket of ACA, Medicare, Medicaid, Kid Care, uh, State Employee Health, I'm sure, figures in. Um, we're going to start with uh, Senator Ellen Roberts of Colorado. She's the president pro tem. Uh, she, in addition, she's chairing the 2015 Legislative Health Insurance Exchange Oversight Committee, so that's uh, got to be a handful. Uh, three quick minutes on uh, comments on where we're headed or, or what you heard today. Um, uh, you know, I was waiting for that bright hope coming down from that end of the table, and unfortunately I didn't hear it either. But um, so Colorado has a uh, state-run health exchange, and I guess the points I would make in three minutes, which is really quick, um, would be that I think it's a misnomer to call it a state-run exchange. I personally feel like the Washington, D.C. is way more directing it than the state of Colorado is. So I was encouraged by the thought that maybe the feds should back off. Uh, we are at an NCSL conference. We do have a 10th Amendment. So I would underscore that the federal government should back off and let, st if you're going to have something called a state-run exchange, you need to let the state actually run it. All of our states are very different. Your economies of scale among the population is very different. And until the states can actually direct a little bit more about what they're doing in their health care policy rather than D.C., I don't think we're going to see cost savings, and I don't think we'll actually reach people with health care. I represent eight rural counties in western Colorado, and if you have a Medicaid card in your wallet, doesn't mean you get care. So we have workforce issues. We have a shortage of doctors. We have a shortage of nurses, providers who can actually take these people who have been put on a program many of them who didn't want to go on Medicaid. One of the challenges in our exchange is that people automatically get, first have to go through the screen of whether you're going to be a Medicaid um, enrollee, when they might want just private care. Why would somebody do that? Because they know that there are no doctors who will take new Medicaid patients. So, I, you know, I appreciated the questions that Steve was asking. How does this actually work? when you've got an exchange, well, 90% of the people in Colorado who enrolled on the exchange actually had a pleasant experience in the sense, in the sense that they got enrolled. 10% had a disastrous experience. 
Some of that can be attributed to our IT challenges, and perhaps that would be one reason a state might go on the federal IT structure. Um, it's been very difficult to create the IT behind the exchanges to actually make it state run, um, and that's something we haven't figured out yet. The state of Colorado currently is trying to fix the IT challenges as opposed to jumping on uh, the federally supported exchange concept, but it may be something we need to revisit. So I, I was not, I did not vote in favor of establishing the exchange. I, I gave it a lot of thought. It wasn't for partisan reasons that I didn't vote for it, but what I saw was an extremely short timeline to create something incredibly complex that was not designed by Colorado, but it was designed by Washington, D.C. I would hope that maybe we could get to a place, if we can indeed do some flexibility in planning, that you separate the Medicaid, this could be a total pipe dream, but let's divorce Medicaid expansion from an exchange. I think you would uh, depoliticize it to some degree, because I think both parties, if you're going to have an exchange and we have uh, a Supreme Court decision that says you're going to have subsidies, whether it's um, you have a state plan or you're on the federal exchange, I'm, I'm over it. I, I don't want to argue anymore about the subsidies or the exchange in that respect, although certainly I have some folks in my caucus who would continue that conversation. But I'd say we are where we are, but um, to have states try and absorb the cost of Medicaid expansion at this time, to me, is very difficult. So if we're, if we're going to have the ACA um, estimates of where we've got to go, which is currently what Washington, D.C. is doing to us, give us more flexibility in the time to meet those goals. Separate Medicaid expansion along with the exchange. Make these two different projects. I mean, the fact is we're citizen legislators. We, we're not healthcare policy consultants, and we have created this incredible industry for consultants across this country as so many of us scratch our heads and say, how can we do it? So I think more dollars have gone to consultants, and I'm not bashing consultants because I don't think we're going to come up with it, but um, frankly, we've created this really lucrative business that's become an essential, an essential component of state policy. Have I run out of time? I think you're right on point. Our next speaker is Assemblyman Herb Conaway. Who, of New Jersey, who's a familiar face to anybody who's been around NCSL. Um, he has uh, uh, been co-chair of our NCSL Federal Health Reform Task Force for the last four years. Back in Trenton, uh, he's a triple threat. He's a physician. He's a lawyer. Boo. I mean, not too bad. Uh, and now the majority whip. So a uh, guy who's got insight from the provider and from the uh, legislative side. Uh, Herb, your thoughts on the, this morning's panel and the future of health care? Well, I, I don't know all about you, but I, I'm hopeful. Uh, I am hopeful because uh, in New Jersey we've seen uh, in this past enrollment period uh, some 254,000 people uh, sign up for coverage uh, through our federally run exchange. 23% of those were re-enrollees. <laughs> Half of uh, those uh, were new enrollees to the program. We've seen increases in the, uh, the uh, access to health care, the attainment of health care across all counties uh, in our state. And, um, and the um, patients, and I, I do direct care, I'm involved in taking care of our um, lower income population in Trenton uh, near the capital. And I can tell you as a, as a frontline <coughs> provider and internist uh, that we have, um, uh, that as a practice physician, it is very uh, heartwarming to see uh, that when recommendations now are made in the examination suite, those recommendations can uh, come to pass because people now have insurance to buy the medications or get the physical therapy or to go to a specialist that was not available to us before uh, the implementation of the ACA. Uh, so, you know, in our hospital, uh, I, like many hospitals across the state of New Jersey, have seen rolling increases in the revenue uh, related to the fact that much less of their care, at least a, a portion of their care now, uh, that was previously uncompensated now, uh, receives compensation for that care through an insurance program. And so, as expected, and one of the things I have to, I would fault the administration for not doing more of is, is to talk about uh, the, uh, the economic boost that this, uh, the health care spending has throughout our economy. People have to work in it. It's highly labor intensive. We've got nurses and techs and other people who are involved in hospital and hospital care uh, have a job. Uh, hospitals that were uh, on the <coughs> printer's closing, operating the rent, are less precarious than they were 
uh, before. I see all of those things as very hopeful um, uh, for the future. Looking at the Supreme Court ruling, uh, if that had uh, been adverse, that ruling, we would have sought, seen 172,000 New Jerseyans lose their, their health insurance, and we would have lost $54 million a month in subsidies, 650-some-odd uh, million annually uh, to, um, in subsidies to the state of New Jersey. Uh, those subsidies have allowed us to reduce uh, the uh, uncompensated care payments that we make to hospitals uh, because uh, those people who were getting uncompensated care are now able to pay for their care uh, through their own insurance or insurance picked by them to meet uh, their uh, particular needs. Uh, and so we have seen um, um, $181 million in savings to our state budget. I think it's one of the things that drove um, our governor, who is um, for uh, well, for philosophical reasons, I'll say, but certainly <laughs> political reasons, uh, to, um, to not necessarily want to do an exchange or to embrace or to be seen to embrace the, governor, uh, the president. Um, as I guess he had, was going to embrace the, the president uh, during the storm. <laughs> sort, of a, sort of a problem for him, I have to tell you. Um, uh, but um, uh, not willing to embrace uh, national health reform. Uh, indeed, we have uh, seen uh, great benefits to our budget. Uh, we have seen uh, great benefits to our hospitals. We have, um, and at the time, uh, budget, um, uh, where there are serious budget constraints, it has been uh, a very welcome thing. So I... Um, I am. Uh, I look forward to the future with uh, with uh, a lot of hope, uh, and, I, and I, it's a hope I see in patients who have health insurance who now uh, do not have it. I know that hospitals who might be on the edge will be able to stay uh, in the business of providing access to care. And I think challenges uh, that have been mentioned uh, here are, are really relate to uh, competition and how we get to state involvement in managing the marketplace is to make sure that we have healthy competition. And, uh, and the marketplace to put uh, to ameliorate rates. And the last uh, market survey that was produced, and this comes from uh, data of, uh, of Health and Human Services, uh, uh, yes, brought through the filter of uh, Kaiser Family Foundation. But you know, looking at uh, you know market basket of uh, various uh, cities across the country, uh, we see an increase uh, in those rates about 4.4 percent. Um, the previous year is about 2 percent. Now. Uh, it varies depending on where you are in the country. Some have seen um, uh, larger increases. Some have seen uh, no increases or have seen decreases in the cost of the care. So, but the average, I think, is very is a helpful sign, seeing that these accelerated rates that we saw in advance of the ACA, 10 percent, 14 percent, not unusual, um, that those may be, we hope that it's going to be a long-term trend, have come down to single digits, and that's something that, that it will be easier for states and indeed our national economy to manage if those trends were continue, to continue. But I think the key will be fostering competition in the marketplace. <laughs> competition does sharpen pencils and will help ameliorate rates. And so that's where I think a lot of work needs to be done uh, in that area. And then one final thing on that area of competition is to make sure these cooperative exchanges, which were, which um, you know, really didn't get all that they needed in, uh, as, the, as the reform passed. And I hope that's one of the things that will be revisited uh, in a new Congress and a new administration. Uh, to make sure that those cooperative exchanges, which might very well be a bulwark against uh, premium increases by uh, uh, other insurers, uh, will help to maintain um, you know, uh, the steadiness in insurance rates uh, going forward. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, it's nice to know that the doctor is optimistic. I think that really bodes well. Um, I don't know if he's willing to take any over-under bets on his prediction about rates being able to be stabilized. I hope uh, he's I right. I might. <laughs> I hope he's right. Um, uh, next up is uh, Senator Charles Scott. He's a mainstay of the Wyoming legislature. He's been in office for just over 35 years, so he has seen the evolution of the health care system uh, from the front lines. He um, lost my place here. He chairs the Senate Labor, Health, and Social Services uh, Committee. He's also vice chairman of the nationally known bipartisan reforming states group. Uh, Mr. Scott, Senator Scott. Okay. Um, let me say that I look at any health reform uh, through a lens of is, does it help solve our fundamental problems and our moderator gave us the statistics on how poorly our health care system in the United States does compared to the rest of the world and those are unfortunately quite accurate. Uh, I'm persuaded that by the work of professors Wenneberg and Fisher at Dartmouth and their colleagues that the real problem with our health care system is not rates or anything, it's excessive utilization of health care. And their statistics are 
that we use 30% more health care than is medically necessary and it's doing us more harm than good because of the risks associated with the unnecessary procedures. So, and anybody that wants to look at their work, uh, Annals of Internal Medicine, February 2003 is where the, the principal original articles were published. Well worth, worth your time to wade through. Um, I look at any reform saying, does it help us solve that problem? And the answer I come to with Medicaid expansion is it does not. Medicaid is notorious for encouraging excessive utilization. The emergency rooms we all hear about are only the worst case. There's a lot more to it than, than just that. Um, so my recommendation to states going forward is the states that have had the sense not to expand Medicaid, stick with it. You're on the, on the right track. And I would add that it is my expectation, you know, when the music stops was the phrase we heard a moment ago. When that happens and we have to pay for what's going on, even a congressman can figure out that if they go back to the something like a 50-50 match in Medicaid or whatever your FMAP is, that the elected officials, the legislators in this room are going to have to do half the tax raising. And that's a good deal for any congressman. They can all figure that one out, and they will. The history of the federal government is such that I think you can almost guarantee that. So you will either have to raise taxes or cut out something else. And in Wyoming, our track record is quite clear. We've preferred to spend our money on education and being an arid state on water development. So we have other priorities, and we want to stick with those. So we turned the Medicaid expansion down, and we'll continue to do so. With regard to the exchanges, we're the small state and union. Exchange would be economically irrational for us because we simply don't have the population to spread the fixed cost to, and that's probably true for a good third of the other states that are on the smaller side. With regard to the waivers, the, the 1332 waiver, I think they're done on the Henry Ford style of choice. You all can remember, well, we probably can't, but maybe your parents or grandparents <laughs> told you that. that Henry Ford said when it came to the color of cars that the customer could have any color he wanted as long as it was black. And that's what the Section 1332, when you look at those statutory guide rails, that's the position they put us in. I think potentially those things are useful in fixing some of the minor glitches that are just irrational. The, the feds will buy some of those just to get that problem out of the way. But for large-scale things, no. And for a smaller state, the demands they've made for actuarial and other studies to justify the budget neutrality are going to be so expensive that it would be economically very difficult for a smaller state to do a full-blown 1332 waiver. So until things loosen up in Washington, don't worry about those. It's not something you, you want to get into. I would say there's a few things that the states ought to pursue. We're seeing a thing called direct primary care, which is essentially paying for uh, your primary care on a retainer basis. You pay so much a month and get what you need. You have to clear out a few insurance laws to make sure that that's legal. We want to try to do a pilot project in Medicaid on that particular score. We think that has a lot of promise because we think primary care does start to turn the cost curve around. But our health department wants to do it on a state funds only basis 
so we don't have to go through all the federal approvals and, and difficulties to get it done. And, and I think we're going to support them on that. Look at that. Look at health savings accounts again. You can do a health savings account for a low-income population if you do a couple of special things. First, they will sometimes legitimately run through all the money in the account, and it'll have to come from the state to start with, largely. You have to be able to refresh that and increase the premium and consequence to retain the incentive, but you have to be able to have a source where there's a legitimate need for additional funds there. Second, have your insurance company or whatever provider is managing your program manage the health savings account and the copayment comes out of there first or at the same time as the insurance payment and you put a stop to the providers removing the incentive, the economic incentive that's in the copayment by saying, we'll take whatever your insurance company will pay after they've jacked the rates through the ceiling. Uh, that's That has defeated that as, as a conserving health policy motion. So look to those things uh, and hope that things loosen up in, in Washington so that some, some reasonable flexibility is possible. But for right now, avoid the Medicaid expansion. Avoid the 1332 waivers. Thank you. Okay, now I want to uh, we, now it's the audience participation portion of this. Uh, we were going to uh, send out uh, Nerf balls and have you guys, but we, we decided instead we'd ask you a few questions. Can I see by show of hands how many legislators are here? Hey, raise your hand if you're a state legislator. Okay, now put your hands down. Raise your hand if you're a, a, a state legislative staffer with uh, health or Medicaid responsibility. Uh, thank you. Raise your hand if you are a um, private sector consultant that doesn't get paid enough, uh, raise your hand. <laughs> or that does get paid enough, come on. Uh, okay, raise your hand if you haven't raised your hand yet. Ken, who are you people? What are you doing here? <laughs> it, we really don't have the Oprah thing here. I, didn't, uh, I lied to you. Uh, but what, <laughs> I've been directed, and you should, turn around and chat with your neighbor for a minute because we want you to kind of congregately think about these two questions. We're going to do this by a show of hands instead of by three by five cards because the questioning we're going to get to is so scintillating that we don't want to take the extra time necessary to collect those cards. Plus, we didn't bring enough cards with us. Um, so, take a minute. Everybody's got 60 seconds to chat about your table. It looks like you're chatting or they're not going to let me off of here. Please, come on over here. Yeah, chat a little bit here. So you Okay, the question is, on question number one, whether we're at, we want to know what you at your table think will be the new gross number of states that expand Medicaid. Currently, it's 29 in D.C. We call it 29 and a half or 29 and an eighth, depending upon what your attitude is. Um, and question number two is, two years from now, how many states will run and administer their own health exchange gross number again? Currently, it's 16 and an eighth right now. Is it going to go up or going to go down? Okay, so you guys are getting the chatting thing. It wasn't as hard as you thought. How much do you have to do with that number? Well, they up or down. Yeah. Okay. All right. Five, yeah, 25. Yeah. You know, that's how we end the story. I'll get to that. For that first dollar. Okay, that's entirely enough socialization. Okay, the, the, we're going to do this by a show of hands. Question number one. Okay, audience, come on, focus on me again here. Uh, two years from now, if you think two years from now that there will be more states that have expanded Medicaid than the current number, so the number will be higher than 29 and 8, raise your hand. So we, you think more than more states will expand Medicaid than they have today? Okay, thank you. You can put your arms down. Rest for a minute. Um, for those raise your raise your hand if you think the number of states uh, will be less than 29 that have a Medicaid expansion in place. So in other words, once once you're you know you're on the cocaine, you're not getting off. Okay. <laughs> now maybe this one's different because actually 
health benefit exchanges actually do cause trouble for legislators. They get phone calls and stuff, and blaming it on your congressman is a pretty good idea. Okay, so if you think more than 16 states in D.C. will be running their own um, health benefit exchange, raise your hand. Okay. If you think exactly the same number are going to be running their own health care exchange, two years from now, raise your hand. If you think less states are going to be operating their own health care exchange, raise your hand. Well, see, I think the audience gets it, <laughs> whether, it's, whether it's a good idea or not. Um, the prizes, when you get a chance, just see Dick on your way out the door. Whoever won the contest, Dick's going to take care of getting you the new car. <laughs> Scooter, it's a scooter, he says. It's yeah. much healthier because you got to pedal. You get to drive into the car. <laughs> okay, you've all been really, really patient. Um, we're going to go to questions. I'm going to encourage the panel that to think of all this as like the lightning round on a 30-minute game show. Uh, we, we don't need long answers, and we really need kind of concise questions. Uh, we've got a microphone here, and, and the two in the middle one, if, if you've got a quick question you'd like to ask one of the erudite panelists or several of them to comment on, come to the mic, I'll call on you. Uh, um, we're going to see if we can get some quick uh, interplay, and uh, not everybody has to answer every question, but we want everybody who's got something to say to have a pop at it, but really be concise in the in the answers. Uh, sir, you tell us what state you're from and your name. I'm uh, Senator McClellan from Maryland. Just a question, there's another dynamic of the ACA. This year, January 1st, the definition of small group changes. You know, Maryland has the individual exchange, but we're trying to maintain a healthy small group. And we feel because of that number, we're going to have a lot of healthy employers leaving and choosing to be self-insured. And Steve, NAIC, we looked at your models. Uh, what do you think the appropriate stop loss ought to be for states that want to maintain that exchange? It, it, it ought to be high, but even better, states ought to look at a 1332 waiver to keep that number at 50. No state went above 50 before the ACA. Everybody that was involved in the state insurance business said keep it at 50. Congress, in its wisdom, chose to make it 100. But So I keep fighting to get it down to 50. And you think if states leave it where it is now, you're going to see this mass exodus of healthy insurance? Uh, uh, yeah, pretty clearly, leaving. if you allow the 50, if you say the 51s to 100s have to be in, the ones that don't want to be in will self-insure. There are options to do that, unless, as you say, you close that down with stop loss. But it's pretty hard to do that at the state level. Yeah. Senator Scott, go ahead. Yes, and, and I would think that one of the things that states ought to do positively is encourage your employers, both in the 50 to 100 and in the under 50 group, to think about self-insuring with a stop loss and see if there's some ways you can facilitate that because that gets you out of many of the features of the federal reform that are running the cost up. Yeah, but for those those small employers that can't afford to be self-insured because they have a high, <laughs> lot of high risk, when you start moving those people out, then that drives the cost of health that's, insurance that's, up. That's, that's, that's going to be a problem, but you've gotten at least some of your constituents out from under. Yeah, yeah but, you know, we've got, uh, uh, f I think, 8,400 small group employees that are in small group because you can't go to 40 to go to self so Thank you very much. No, thank you. Good question. Well, uh, just to add, at least, you know, they're going to get... Uh, Turn the mic because we're, we're, we're webcasting. You know, we staying in, it. though, gets them, uh, you know, a premium uh, tax credit. So, you know, maybe one of the reasons why there hasn't been, a, you know, to, to lose that tax credit is something that businesses may not wish to uh, give up. So... Um, uh, just comment, the tax credits just are, are there driving people in the exchange on the business side just as it helps uh, individuals uh, uh, purchase their own insurance. Quick clarification, Senator Scott, and then we're going to get the question. The, the tax credit, I hate to agree with my friend, uh, but that, <laughs> tax, <laughs> that tax credit, I run a small business. We should have been eligible for that tax credit. We were. Uh, that tax credit has got so much fine print, it's a fraud. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Some from the federal government that's got a lot of fine print doesn't work very well. What are you talking about? Please tell us what state you're from and uh, state your question. Okay. I'm from Missouri, Sue Allen. I'm a state rep. Um, I have been, uh, I've been told of a term, a uh, risk corridor. And this came from someone from our delegation in D.C. Could someone clarify that for me, please? 
Okay, the risk corridor question. Uh, let's do, um, go ahead, and we'll go to Senator Scott. Risk corridor is a temporary program for the first three years, so it only runs through 2016. And what it says is if the actuaries get it wrong, if they underprice the product they and uh, lose money, they get some of it back. And if the company gets some of it back, and if the actuaries get it wrong on the other side and overprice the product, they have to give money back. That's the basic concept, and it's supposed to be revenue neutral, uh, but there's no guarantee under the law, and that's the big thing that's controversial is what happens if most companies overprice or most companies underprice and it doesn't balance out. That's what the, a lot of the square machine in Washington has been about. Now, where does that money come from? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's part, the, the, the law is predicated on the number of people overpriced being equal to the number of people underpriced, and if that doesn't happen, then Congress and the administration are square machine about what would happen in that case. Now, this is this is a general mail, General Motors bailout for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Make sure they can price for whatever they want, drive everybody else out of the business, and then um, they'll get refunded by the government. Senator Scott, only kidding. I think I love the blues. Well, that happens. Uh, that mostly uh, covered it. You need to pay. But I would ask the problem we had in our state is the federal government, I think, due to exchange problems simply didn't pay one of our insurers and they wound up on the on the in the Cheyenne newspaper as being in financial trouble because they weren't being paid by the feds is that covered at the risk carders? uh you mean because they're the, you're talking about the premium payments to the carrier yeah no, that's not a risk order issue. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's, ca that's cash flow, which really matters, but that's not a, <laughs> a quick question. Then tell us what state you're from. State rep from Utah. Joe, you talked about the fanciful creative scoring that CBO does in, in your experience. What is the likelihood and the time frame for the federal government to decrease their 90% expansion match to something less? Do you think it will happen? And if it does, when will it happen? Well, I, I think it is, it is a matter of time. Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, more than a little awkward to have two different match rates. If we're going to keep that system, uh, to have uh, the bulk of the population at the lower match rate, and uh, these new people at the higher match rate uh, causes all sorts of equity issues and so on, as far as the federal uh, budget is concerned, that, that could, I don't think it'll happen until uh, potentially the next uh, uh, president's term. But certainly, uh, they're going to be skirmishing over, over uh, budgets every single is going to be on the agenda. Uh, again, whether it's a Democrat or, or a Republican, I, there's, there's a, a problem. Washington has a problem with health spending in general. And they're going to be looking again for ways to cut. They have big cuts in Medicare, but I think they've gone maybe about as far as they can go, and they're going to have to be looking somewhere else. And frankly, low-income populations are where Washington politicians generally look. Very, very quick, Joe. Yeah. Joe, can you, can you tell me where Medicaid has in the past cut the rate of reimbursement to the states? No, it hasn't happened yet. In, in 50 years, it has not happened. It has not happened yet. <laughs> okay. However... Listen, I love this group. They're going to be here afterwards. They've all said they're going to spend the weekend. So if you get a box lunch, come in. They'll be, they'll, they're going to invite them to your table. We're going to start a, a final closing round. I'm going to ask Senator Roberts 45 seconds of uh, good words and thoughts, and, or you can compliment the moderator, whatever occurs to you. We're going to wrap up and go down the line. Senator Roberts. Well, we just used 10 seconds by passing the mic. So, um, no, I think I'm really encouraged by the number of people who are in the room, and I do want to actually thank NCSL for creating the space to talk about this because my state with its state-run exchange um, has its challenges, but I certainly think that health care costs are what probably have most of us in this room very concerned about. We want people to be in good health, but we have other things to pay for, too. K-12 being one of them. So we see, uh, I think, politically a very interesting dynamic where usual allies are now competing for each other, which is the dollars. It's K-12 versus Medicaid. So this is a problem that state legislatures, regardless of the party you're in, um, this we're going to grapple and, and wrestle and all that sort of thing. So thanks for being here and uh, spending your time with us. Yes, I think the audience ought to give itself a big hand. This is a tremendous turnout, and I think... 
Doctor, can you give us your 45 seconds uh, closing wisdom? Well, I know you, you all came to see Charlie Scott and, 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 and uh, <laughs> enjoy his wisdom. It's a great friend. Great friend. But I, I would say that um, we, um, I'm, I'm very positive uh, and remain positive uh, about this program. And I think, actually, for the, uh, the enormous task of, uh, of trying to enroll millions of people in a program that is new, uh, to have been able to adjust on the fly and continue to get people enrolled and, gi and give to people uh, the the um, the chance at good health that having insurance has, I think, is a remarkable feat. That that in the time periods involved might, could only have been done here in this country by uh, the best and brightest, uh, putting together something that can work for so many people who are dispossessed of insurance. We uh, certainly will have cakes, things to work out. Uh, as we go forward. A lot of doctors, quite frankly, have a concern about the bronze plans and the payments in those and the, and the incentives in there because there's a, lo a lot of costs shifted to uh, individuals. And when that happens, we know they underutilize health care very often and that there's bad debt that, that goes to hospitals and, and to physicians that, that are going to need to be addressed as some of the kinks as we think about making reform going forward. But uh, individuals having insurance uh, means they have better health means that there are better uh, producers for this country. Uh, it means jobs for those who are involved in health care. And so um, uh, I see and look forward to more of that, uh, not less of it, because um, it is one of the great wants, uh, the great security needs of individuals to have security in your health care. So I'm positive. For the Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Senator Scott? Yes. In the run-up to the passage of the ACA, I remember watching President Obama on the TV pitching it and talking about the need for health care reform. And he made a very good case that we need a health care reform. Unfortunately, my judgment is the reform that we got has made our basic problems worse rather than better. And what I'm hoping is that in another few years, once the current partisan passions over the ACA and the way it was passed and the way it was implemented die down a bit, we can again look to say, okay, we really need health care reform. We're buying more health care than is good for us. We're getting poor results. We can't afford it. <coughs> Let's do something real about it, which we have not done at this point. So an optimist as well. We're all kind of fortunate. <laughs> Joe, you're well, up, and Joe's going to have the last word, so well, I'm, be busy. I'm, I'm wildly, wildly optimistic myself, uh, but uh, not because of what, what uh, we're necessarily going to do or what the government's going to do. Uh, one, of the, one of the lessons of, of uh, uh, the American economy is that, uh, in essence, no matter what the government does, there is the private sector, and the private sector won't just sit there. Now, it might be induced because of incentives, regulations, rules, whatever, to do things that we don't like, but it's not going to sit there. And so I think the, the challenge is to find a way to grab a little control from Washington and uh, try to shape the forces in a way that gets the private sector to react in a good way rather than a bad way. That's another optimistic message. I'm really liking this group. I'm going to have to be optimistic, too. Every time I'm on a panel with Senator Scott, I find myself having to be off of him as a reference point. So I'll do two points of reference off what he said. One, look at the rest of the world. They've all done a lot better than we have. The interesting consistency across all those countries is they have everybody in the system. They cover everybody. That's a predicate for actually being successful on cost control. We used to think it was the opposite in this country. As long as we keep people out, it won't, it, we can solve our cost problem first. So I'm optimistic that the coverage part of this has worked. We've expanded coverage. We have challenges on the cost side, but we're going to be in a better place to solve those cost issues because we have everybody in the system instead of a mismanaged, unmanageable uh, system. So that's the first round of optimism. The second thing I heard Senator Scott say was, you know, we got to hope for the federal government to get more flexible. I, I don't think where I come from the federal government's going to do that unless somebody's pressing the case, and in my book, that's the states that ought to be pressing that case. That's where we're going to get flexibility on the federal government. I think people have kind of given up on this administration. It's unfortunate because I think there's more flexibility, but at least with the next administration, I hope the states will have the attitude that the insurance commissioner has always had in my 15 years of federal regulation, I mean of state regulation of insurance, was 
you know, if you're going to try to take my turf, then I'm going to fight you for it. And I hope that attitude can, once we get past in the next administration some, some of the partisanship, the attitude can come back that the states are going to fight it out to get more of the control here. And I think that's the way we change that. So the final piece of optimism in, we're all in the stew pot together. If we're going to, if we don't have consensus to turn down the heat, we're all cooked. So uh, can I ask the audience to give this panel a great round of applause? They've been very patient. Now, to say good things when you do the rating of this session, I mean, you got to, otherwise we don't get raises. All right. Thank you. I have a great uh, uh, annual meeting. I didn't know you were so new flyer. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. Great panel. Great panel. Just on spending. It's a great panel. Thank you.